When crime finds itself licensed, there are no limits to its abuses. All right, welcome back. It's good to be back. I was out for a little bit on vacation, long 4th of July weekend, went out to Napa wine country in California, just gorgeous out there, and it's definitely some much-needed R&R, but back in the saddle now, happy to be with you, and I have a very cool listener question today about sports ball. It is not often in the life of a humble book bro that his interests in high culture and the canon and the West and great literature gets to merge with his off-the-clock interest in sports, but This is that time for me. Sometimes I think we don't associate sports with the more elevated ideas or questions or matters that we deal with here on this show that come up in the great works of the Western canon. Perhaps hoity-toity academics tend to think that sports conversation is beneath them, at least in their professional lives. But it turns out that taking a look at sports and the history of sports, which has been around forever for as long as there have been human societies. They seem to have done some kind of recreational sporting activity. Um, This can actually reveal a lot, a lot of profound and sometimes kind of unsettling stuff about human nature. And it can help us to think about some of the primal forces that are at work in our civilization that are always at work on the edges of society and civilization, but might now sort of unnervingly be coming back to the center of our lives, in particular as the influence of Christianity and more broadly the Abrahamic scriptures kind of recedes from Western civilization, you're starting to see more and more of what I have come to call the allegoric forces, that is the forces that seem like they might just be metaphors or ideas, but actually start to take the shape of pagan gods. And so that's what this listener question is about, and I'm excited to answer it. I am going to get into it, but most of all, I'm excited to answer it because it gives me an opportunity to tell you guys one of the most wild out-of-pocket stories from Western history that nobody's ever heard. I mean, obviously some people have heard of it, but it's not one that typically makes it directly into your high school history books. This is a story that's got absolutely everything. It's got sex, it's got violence, it's got arson, it's got people acting utterly ratchet and doing the most in the streets. It's got theological speculation about the natures of the second person of the Godhead. It's the story of the Nika riots, the story of an absolutely catastrophic event in Byzantine history, the history of the Eastern Roman Empire. It takes place in 532 AD. If you go on the Wikipedia page for sports riots, which have again, happened throughout history, and you look at the list they've got of riots that have happened around or because of sporting events, the Nika riots are the very first one that show up. Now, I'm sure they are not, the Nika riots were not the first (laughs) riots to ever emerge around a sporting event, but they were the biggest and the boldest and the most consequential uh, that first made it into our historical archives. So they made such a big impact that we have a lot of text about them from the time. Almost all of it is utterly partisan, extravagant, extreme, over the top. So there's kind of a fun historical detective game where you get to puzzle through what actually happened in the midst of all this chaos. It is, in fact, ultimately a very serious story. It has some elements that can be kind of like hilarious or maybe more just like a train wreck where you can't look away, but by the time it's over and the dust settles, you really do end up reflecting on some major issues, and that's why I want to get into this listener question, but first I want to just tell you this story. So let's get into it, but before I do, let me remind you about a very important deadline that is coming up on August 10th. That is the last day that you can sign up for the Ancient Language Institute's Fall courses. This is my sponsor, the Ancient Language Institute, which is a place you can go to learn four ancient languages, Latin, Ancient Greek, Biblical Hebrew, and Anglo-Saxon. And if you're listening to this show at all, and you have any interest in the larger history of Western civilization and the great works that have emerged from it, there's just no reason for you not to be studying these languages. If you think you can't, if you think you're not 
good at languages or you've had trouble in school memorizing long lists of vocabulary or you don't have time or whatever, the Ancient Language Institute is for you. Their mode of teaching is totally different from the stuff you probably encountered in school if you did encounter these languages in school. It's extremely intuitive. You will be reading really quickly. You'll just be able to crack open texts very early on and learn by real examples of these languages. And what better way could there be to get face-to-face -face with the ancient authors that we talk about on this show, that we love, that have formed each and every one of us, whether or, or not we know it. So what you got to do is you got to go to ancientlanguage.com slash young heretics. That's the special link, and I will drop it in the description of this show, so you can click on it there. And... And for the most secret society on the internet, for my listeners only, for those who are currently listening to my voice, not written down anywhere, but if you're hearing me now, you can put in my name, S-P-E-N-C-E-R, Spencer, at checkout, and you will get 10% off your registration fee. These courses do fill up. I imagine that there aren't that many spots left at this point, but there are some, and the deadline is August 10th. So go to ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics before then, use promo code Spencer, and sign up you will not regret it. Okay, the Nika riots. Let me start here by kind of laying out the cast of characters because this was an extremely turbulent time in the history of Constantinople, in the longer history of the Roman Empire and especially the Eastern Roman Empire, which had been brought essentially into being not long before. Remember, Constantinople is the city in Turkey that was originally Byzantium, which is why this empire, this part of the empire, or this remainder of the empire that continues on after the sack of Rome, sometimes is called the Byzantine Empire. But that's a bit of a misnomer in that it was only before the imperial seat came to this city that it was called Byzantium. And once Constantine, the first Roman Empire ever to profess Christianity, once he brought his forces and his majesty and his power to the city, he renamed it after himself, Constantinople. And it was supposed to be his base of power in the east, while Rome was still one unit. But it was starting to get so big and unruly that it couldn't be managed only from the traditional capital in Rome. There gradually emerged a number of different cities that became kind of nodes of power. Rome remained one, but so was Ravenna in the west and Constantinople, Byzantium in the east. It's the city that is now called Istanbul, which they renamed, and why they gave Constantinople the works? Well, that's nobody's business but the Turks. That's a story for another day. At this point in time, we've got this big other Rome in the east, gloriously constructed in many ways to mimic or reproduce or even rival the old Rome. And as the Western Roman Empire sort of crumbles into decay and eventually splits off and finally will kind of turn into the patchwork of competing tribal nations that is going to turn into Europe, in the east, we still have this empire that really thinks of itself as the Roman Empire that goes on and continues long into history, into the uh, 15th century AD. So that's what's going on in Constantinople. In 532, and during the, this kind of set of very turbulent decades that leads up to the Nico riots, the emperor is Justinian, who's one of the most famous emperors from ever, really. He's one of the most famous Christian Roman emperors, and he's one of the most controversial in the historical record. Nowadays, I think it's fair to say he's broadly considered a kind of hero of the faith. And not only he, but his wife, Theodora, who was a major part of his reign, are kind of looked upon as originators of a lot of not just Western history, not just major players in Western history, but it kind of, they, they seem to have implanted a lot of the values and ideas that have still become more and more important over time, especially in law. Justinian was best known to posterity as the great legal reformer, and it seems as if a lot of that came 
from or with the influence of Theodora because Theodora had risen up from low birth. She was a a woman of humble means and her awareness of what it meant to be an outcast, to be among the prostitutes and sinners as Christ was, seems to have really prompted her to push Justinian to elevate the status of women in law. And this is not like, I'm not saying this in the kind of modern girl bossy sense of, yeah, you go girl, because then women could be like lawyers or whatever. But there was a lot of stuff about whether women could hold property, what they what their legal status was when they were unmarried, that genuinely did make it painful, difficult, or impossible to live if you weren't a high-born noble woman. Theodora knew this. She pushed Justinian to reform the law. Those were not the only legal reforms he made, but his reforms overall are cited as kind of a huge watershed moment, and the law codes that came down from that time would eventually sort of shiver out through the network of European law and remain influential to this day. So that's a big part of what Justinian's remembered for, also his building projects, and most importantly for perhaps our story, his military projects. Because the Roman Empire, as it was constituted when he took power, was kind of on the back foot. He took back a lot of territory that had been lost, mostly with the help of one of the great generals in all of history, Belisarius, who also has a role to play in our story. Belisarius led campaigns into a range of places around the Mediterranean, perhaps most famously against the Vandals, whose name still goes down in infamy because, of course, they sacked Rome at one point, but they generally were known for the devastation and wastage that they lay, the kind of wanton destruction of property. That's why our word vandal or vandalize means that. But Belisarius beat them back in northern Africa, which is which is a major center of power for the Eastern Empire at this time. And there were a bunch of other victories that sort of made Justinian famous through the influence of his great generals. But... All of this having been said, one does not simply accomplish enormous things in the history of Western civilization without making some enemies. And Justinian had lots, and they were passionate. One major feature of this seems to be that in order to marshal the forces it took to kind of turn the tide in some of these key military areas, Justinian had to raise a lot of taxes. And that came along with a kind of a crackdown. Of course, he was a legal particularist, and so it seems like his rule was considered despotic and tyrannical by some of the people that it harmed. And we do get from this period hostile reports, including the one that I read to you, perhaps the most extravagant and alarming one that I read to you at the beginning of this episode from The Secret History, which is an amazing title by an amazing guy, Procopius, who actually accompanied Belisarius, went with Belisarius on his expedition to Africa against the Vandals, and so served in the administration of Justinian, but at one point turned against Justinian and Theodora, and boy, howdy, did he turn against them. This is not your modern-day, neutral, dispassionate historical account. This is a broadside, man. He decided with extreme prejudice that Theodora was an utter... I, 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 I want to use words, bad words here. I'm not going to, uh, out of respect for Theodora and out of respect for my listeners, but that, that she was a woman of uh, not only ill repute, but continued low morals. And I would blush to tell you some of the stories that Procopius tells about Theodora while she was in the palace, that she just basically began as a prostitute, ended as a prostitute, and brought this incredible lust and greed into the highest chambers of of power. And this disgusted Procopius, he certainly goes well beyond what can possibly have been true. 
That doesn't mean that some of this might not have happened. We don't, I think, have enough unbiased reporting to exactly know the extent to which Theodora violated the codes and conventions of high society in Constantinople. Some of that might have just been violation that we would now look on as good. In other words, it might have been the fact that she advocated for women of, of low means, outcasts in society that got her this reputation for much uglier stuff that she never actually did. All the same, Procopius doesn't think so. Procopius is thoroughly devoted to the story that Justinian and Theodora alike are demons in human flesh. I am not making that up or exaggerating it in order to make this sound more exciting. That is actually what he says again and again in no uncertain terms. Here's just a little, a little sample from The Secret History to give you a sense of what's going on. I, like most of my contemporaries, never once felt that these two were human beings. They were a pair of bloodthirsty demons, for they plotted together to find the easiest and swiftest means of destroying all races of men and all their works, assumed human shape, became man-demons, and in this way convulsed the whole world. Now, if this is your point of view, and if you are, like Procopius, a serious critic of the Justinian administration, it's not as if you don't have any evidence to point to. There was a major plague during Justinian's time, which some, including Procopius, viewed as a judgment of God for the excesses and overreach of both Justinian and Theodora. But if you really wanted to make the case that Justinian's reign was, a, was one of lawless chaos and degradation and total social decay, you would have no better place to go than the Nika riots. This would be kind of exhibit A that you would cite if you were trying to detract from the historical reputation of Justinian and Theodora in the argument that they just messed everything up, that they could do no right and in fact intended to do no right. Now, the real story, of course, is much more complicated, and it comes down to a long-standing sports rivalry between two teams of fans called the Blues and the Greens. So, who were these guys? Well, there were kind of two big spectator sport events that went deep into the history and culture of the Roman Empire and, indeed, the Roman Republic, and these were gladiatorial combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat of some kind, and chariot racing. And these evolved over the course of the empire into massive spectacles. And, of course, the most famous being the gladiatorial ones that we've seen in the movie Gladiator. We can still see the Colosseum. This is maybe the number one sports image that people associate with Rome. But there is also the Circus Maximus still visible in Rome. You can still visit it in the modern city of Rome. Also made famous on screen, most notably through Ben-Hur, if you've seen that classic movie. There's an enormous chariot racing scene that kind of gets across how violent and dangerous and also exciting these events could be. But back before any of that pomp and circumstance, glitz and glamour, both of these sports had a deep, deep history, not just in Roman culture, but in Greek culture as well. And indeed, as far back as we can get textual resources, like in the Iliad, for instance, we have images of the warriors who are fighting against the Trojans, passing the time, and indeed marking major occasions with sporting competitions that include hand-to-hand -hand combat and chariot racing. So this is one, these are just some of the traditional sports that have now been elevated to the status of like Thunderdome, Nissan Stadium, whatever you want to picture here, like times a million, right? People got so into this from every rank of society. There was nobody that didn't care in some respects. When Christians came along, they were often appalled and horrified at the degree to which people got carried away with bloodthirst, wanting to see things go wrong in these sports, everybody would always bring maximum passion to these events. And the teams that rooted for the different chariot racers formed into these cadres that had more kind of attached to them than just, oh, we want to see this guy win the race. And this is the first element of sports fandom that we can recognize from the modern day, that it's not just a particular group of guys that you want to see move a particular ball in a particular way. 
all these other allegiances, interestingly, start to attach to sports fandom. You know, of course, that your sports team is attached to a particular city, and you might be a diehard partisan of the Bulls or something because of where you grew up. I, for example, in baseball, which I don't watch as much anymore, but I still, when I watch baseball, I still root for the Yankees, not because I have any attachment to the current guys on the team, but because New York is my ancestral home on my father's side. And and we always rooted for the Yankees when I was a little kid. So no matter what happens, basically, I'm going to be on their side because of my affection for New York. And you get all sorts of other little cultural attachments, like, oh, we eat this kind of food on this team, right? Like, like the Dodger dog or whatever. We wear this kind of clothing. And we even perhaps believe in certain values you see on high school football teams, right? We believe in service and leadership and these sorts of ideals that the passion of sporting and sports games can kind of get channeled in all these different ways. And this is, I think, the first thing to think about as we lay the groundwork for the Nika riots, is that sports is always more than just sports. And why is this? Well, one reason, I think, is because the part of our human soul that fights wars is not only there in our soul when we are fighting wars. So, at the extremes of human conflict, of course, when you have a unresolvable fight over territory or ideals or any number of other things, you go to war and there is, is bloodshed. And that there, I believe, can be just and unjust wars. But fundamentally what you're doing when you're at war is you are implementing a solution when no other solution has worked and you are killing and being killed in the name of some thing. And in order to do that, it is well known, you need courage, daring do, physical courage especially, but courage generally, the willingness to stick it out and stand your ground. And when you talk about courage, which the Greeks would have called Andrea, and the Romans might have called Virtus, when you, when you talk about that sort of fortitude and that strength, you then have to talk about the spirit in the soul that enables that courage, which the Greeks would have called thumos. And thumos is something we have talked about on many episodes of the show because it poses a unique moral problem, a unique ethical problem, in that courage is an ethical virtue. It is the virtue that enables us to act on our ethics. And if those ethics are good, then courage is an unqualified good. And thumos, therefore, can be refined into an excellence, which is what a virtue is. And yet, courage is still in some sense recognizably courage, even when it is directed in an ugly way and a bad way. And so thumos and the passions and the spirit that enable us to be courageous have this kind of morally ambiguous nature that is then shaped by the purpose or the goal at which it is aimed. And this is where we get into the question of whom does Thumos serve? If you've got all this pent-up passion and spiritedness and anger and courage, where is it going to be directed? And the ideal, the classical idea, is that it will be directed in the service of virtue and especially in the service of logos, which is the part of you that is most in command of rational faculties and that can connect to absolute ideals and truths. And that's when you have virtue and justice in your wars as well as in your fights, right? What, what, you, fight for, what you fight for is good. But thumos can also be made to serve or obey the passions, just your raw desire. And then you enter into a situation where might makes right, where it's not right or true ideals that are guiding your thumos, but rather your thumos that is kind of leading the uh, reasonable part of you by the neck in service of whatever you happen to want, whatever your appetites happen to be directing you to get at this time. What this shows us, what this tells us, is that thumos, that passion, that energy, that courageous part of you needs a leader. It needs a purpose. It needs a cause. It can't just sit there inert because then it has no shape or form. And so one thing we do to train and to cultivate and hone that courage and use it when it's not being used in war is we 
use it for, for games, for sports. And sports are kind of this structure that we build in order to cultivate and shape that courage. And this is why the heroes who are at war do sports when they're on their downtime, or at least it's one reason, is they've still got all of that manly daring do that they have to direct in some way. Competition enables them to direct it against each other, but not importantly, with the purpose of bloodshed. Even if there's injury on the field, that doesn't mean you're trying to injure each other. You have a different goal in mind. It gives you this goal that you attach to so passionately. But when you have then this kind of well, this this heat sink for all the courage, right, where you take this force in human civilization and you put it in sports, it's going to attract other purposes. It's going to attract to itself other aspirations, goals, and causes, because that's what Thumas does. It seeks a cause. And so that's why in sports, you gather around yourself all these other causes. And it's one reason why high school sports is more than just kind of an extracurricular pastime. It's a genuine character forming activity that we encourage kids to participate in, because if they have a good coach, if they have somebody that knows how to manage and shape their courage, then that kind of purpose and passion can be directed not just toward beating the other guys, but also toward, let's say, service. Maybe you get your team together and you have a day of community service, and that same team spirit can get redirected instantly to, we're all going to go out and build houses for the homeless or whatever. Why? Because that's what Thumas does. It seeks a cause. And if you give it good causes and you train it to attach to good causes, it will gradually serve you in more ways than just beating the other team. There's an amazing Onion article from back when The Onion was funny. And it's a, an opinion column by a guest columnist who just, <laughs> the headline is, you will suffer humiliation when the sports team from my area defeats the sports team from your area. And it's this kind of template, this neutral template, one size fits all, at, written in this very elevated language for how sports fans talk to each other. And it's just, it devolves into the most juvenile trash talk, but always in this kind of formalized language. And then I think there's a counterpoint from the other guy that says, no, you will suffer humiliation. And, and this is the kind of, what's funny about that joke is that it takes out all of the particular goals that people attach to their sports teams. And it just gives you the kind of template form. It's like people, whatever the cause is, they're going to get this way. They're going to start telling you that like your mother is a uh, fat pig because you root for the wrong team or whatever. That's that passion attaching to whatever it is you give it to attach to, which means it can also attach to ugly things and very easily, which I think is one of the things Procopius was suggesting when he talks about how lawlessness has the this kind of incentive power. It's like a blaze that if you control it can do good things, but if you let it loose will just catch on to everything and start to destroy everything in its sight. And this, for example, is one reason why when the uh, BLM riots were ripping through the country and football players were taking a knee, and some of them in, in support of BLM, and the NFL itself was voicing support, and there were all of these moments where conservatives were saying things like, get get politics out of sports, right? There was this kind of typical libertarian-ish right-wing talking point, just don't bother me with your values and your politics. And on one level, that is a fair thing to say, because you shouldn't be thinking about this major kind of divisive issue when you're watching sports. But that's because sports is supposed to be our national sports is supposed to be our communal American enterprise, which is not in itself an apolitical thing. So it's not exactly that we want to get politics out of sports. It's that we want to get partisan politics out of sports and direct that political, inherently political energy, which is in sports, we want to attach it towards something that we all agree on and love, and we ought to all agree on and love America, although sadly that's not the case at the moment. Nevertheless, when you have a group of guys getting together to do sports and to activate that part of the soul that seeks to 
make its will, to impose its will on the world, right? That's what Thumos wants to do. You want to organize and direct that will in a good way, which means that sports isn't actually totally apolitical and does, can and does, and perhaps even should, attach itself to political ideals. But if there's no good political ideals on offer, it's going to attach itself to some other set of ideals. And these blues and the greens who started to fight in Constantinople and who had this long-standing rivalry that went back, back ages, and initially, there had been four different teams uh, with four different colors, but they get kind of consolidated into these two teams. The conflict comes to a head. And just like modern sports rivalries, this chariot racing rivalry gets attached to all sorts of other stuff that would seemingly have nothing to do with racing chariots. And part of it is this political stuff that I've been raising. Justinian, I think, probably misguidedly, announces himself a partisan of the Blues, which inflames the tension and sort of lines the Blues up on Justinian's side of these debates over law and taxes and war. And then the Greens become kind of the street toughs because they're on the outs with the establishment. So you've got these political dimensions to this conflict. But at this stage, at least in history, and I would argue in some sense always, politics is also theological. And the major disputes of the day aren't just about where are we going to go on campaign, who are we going to fight, all that stuff. They're also about the nature of the Godhead. This is the time of the high ecumenical councils, which give us to this day the debates that ultimately result in orthodoxy. When you think about what counts as orthodoxy, a lot of that is decided through passionate, violent, and minute disputes right now over questions about what the Trinity is. Because we have this idea developing that there are these three persons of the Godhead, but it's developing in the context of Greek civilization and Greek philosophy in many cases, which always asks questions about specifics, right? If you were going to say that there are three persons in one, one God and three persons, that they all share the Godhead or however you want to put it, you're going to get Greek philosophers, if you convert them, you're going to get them asking, well, what exactly does that mean? Because if normally we define a person by his distinctness from other entities, and these sorts of questions become translated into what we would now describe as like hypostatic issues of hypostasis and all of these kind of technical theological terms emerge from these Greek disputes. The one that was raging at the time, even though it had been going on since the previous century, since the 400s, the one that was raging in the 530s was the dispute over the two natures of Christ. And just to give you a really 10,000 foot view and bear in mind that every word I'm about to use can mean multiple different things. There are shades and flavors and nuances of interpretation in every possible version of this. Basically, what you have here is begins with this conflict between two clerics, Nestorius and Cyril of Alexandria. And Nestorius becomes associated with Nestorianism, and that is basically the idea that these two natures of Christ, that he is divine and human, are completely separate and distinct. Nestorius is accused, actually, of dividing, drawing this unbreakable divide in the person of Christ so that it almost starts to look like there are two persons. And some versions of this get really science fiction-y, like the Godhead can't possibly have mingled with the humanity of the man Jesus, and so it must have just been piloting him around, kind of like a bone mech, right? It might have, it must have just been in the cockpit or using him as a kind of puppet. And these are caricatures, but they're caricatures that get raised at the time. And this represents kind of one extreme of the question. The other extreme would be what is called monophysitism, which is an amazing word coming from the Greek word monos, only or one, and phusis, nature. And it gets Extra confusing here because there's also something called miaphysitism, which is sort of more of a modern coinage or a later coinage. At the time, they would have talked about monophysitism as the idea that there is only one mingled, totally fused nature in Christ, that his humanness was his divinity, his divinity was his humanness. And the accusation here would be that you're 
in some sense, corrupting Christ's divinity. That if Jesus is divine, it's not because our humanity is in some sense divine, but because he's entering into humanity from his divine nature. And so you want to retain the distinction between the human and the divine. Christianity does not teach, at least it doesn't teach now after these disputes, Christianity does not teach that mankind is in some sense divine as he is. In fact, we have a very different view about mankind has fallen and in need of salvation. And yet, at the same time, you want to say that Christ was fully human, even though he was also fully divine. So how do you square the circle? Well, the answer that comes down to us from history is Chalcedonianism, from the Council of Chalcedon, and this is going to become orthodoxy. And the Council of Chalcedon decides that you have two totally distinct natures, a divine nature and a human nature, in one person, one hypostasis, one underlying entity. And the way that I think about this, for what it's worth, is that everything Christ does is at the same time a human act that we can recognize. And the council did say that in his humanity, Christ is homoousios with us. He is essentially the same as us. But in his divinity, he is homoousios with God, which is different from being the same as us. And so the things that he does are at one and the same time. The same thing is both a human gesture and a divine gesture. Act. And by outline, charting that path through humanity that is also divinity, he opens up for us a route into salvation, that we can become reunited with God through this activity. And it's one of my favorite concepts in the world, palimpsestic, which is to say these two things are kind of layered on top of one another in the same space-time. But that... Two, when I say that, I'm sure that there are going to be people, Orthodox listeners, who say that's absolutely not quite right, and there's these other things, and in, you know, 790, there was whatever. That's really not my concern here. It's just to outline this is the, the shape of the debate. And the blues and the greens also get kind of wrapped up into this to the extent that the greens get allied with the monophysite position, which is a highly controversial position to take. And therefore, this enormous theological dispute, which let me just say that you can look back now on these disputes and think of them as trivial. And certainly they got out of hand to the point that minor differences led to these enormous and bitter schisms. But when you start to examine these very finicky, thin line questions about the nature of the Godhead, you start to realize that they spiral out over time exponentially into these enormous implications. Like, it makes a big difference if you say Jesus was divine because he was human and therefore you in your raw, unchanged humanity are divine versus Jesus was divine and human distinctly but in one and therefore what you currently are, which is human, can in some sense be united to the Godhead but only through the intervention, the intercession of the divine nature. So these are actually major things about that have consequences for what you need to be saved and what you need to do in order to live your best life, I mean, literally. So these are major, major issues. And on top of them, you've got these political allegiances that are also getting layered on. And so the tensions are just mounted so incredibly high and they have all attached themselves to this sports rivalry because that's where attachments go. Sports is just this kind of big giant ball of desire, passion, directedness, right, action, daring do, that needs somewhere to point to be aimed. And that's where it, it, all of these tensions go. So the whole thing comes to a head in 532. And what's really remarkable is that up until this point, the blues and the greens have been mortal enemies. In fact, they've been, get, been getting more and more violent toward each other. And they're starting to upend the peace and to threaten and disturb the peace and get into these street skirmishes. They become kind of like the sharks and the jets. And Procopius, of course, blames this on Justinian. He says it's because Justinian aligned himself with the blues, even though this was a long-standing thing. And he goes into this endless diatribe about the different clothes that these guys would wear, and especially the extravagant and distasteful nature of the blues behavior because of course these were Justinian's guys and he kind of enters into like Derek the menswear guy mode if you've ever seen that Twitter account where he'll just take celebrities and different 
figures, public figures, and critique things that are wrong with their outfits, even though they think they look really good. There's all these ways in which the collar is wrong. Like, that's Procopius in this moment. He talks about the blues here. He says, they decided to wear the purple stripe on their togas and swaggered about in a dress indicating a rank above their station. For it was only by ill-gotten money they were able to buy this finery. And the sleeves of their tunics were cut tight about the wrists, while from there to the shoulders they, they were of an ineffable fullness. Whenever they moved their hands, as when applauding at the theater or encouraging a driver in the Hippodrome, that's the name of the Constantinople version of the Circus Maximus, the track that the horses would run out, it's called the Hippodrome. Whenever they moved their hands to applaud at the Hippodrome, these immense sleeves fluttered conspicuously, displaying to the simple public what beautiful and well-developed physiques were these that required such large garments to cover them. They did not consider that by the exaggeration of this dress, the meagerness of their stunted bodies appeared all the more noticeable. So these guys are wearing pump covers. I don't know if you know this gym term where it's like a big shirt or a hoodie that you wear to cover over your muscles and then you remove it at just the right time and suddenly everybody's amazed that the bro's so big underneath there. But, but Justinian says, homies don't even lift. Like they want to look like they're huge with these giant pump covers, but actually they're, they're, they're scrawny and, and tiny. <laughs> they just suck. So you see in Procopius' account of this story how high passions are running because Procopius is involved in those passions. And what's really amazing here is that these guys are disturbing the peace. They're getting into riots and kind of skirmishes in the streets. And Justinian, despite his affinity for the blues starts to lay down the law. And the minute that happens, the minute they have a common enemy, it the blues and the greens unite into one giant anti-Justinian faction or anti-law and order faction. I'm going to read just a little bit of the account from this guy, Anthony Caldellus, who writes a history of Byzantium called the New Roman Empire. And it's a, a huge doorstopper that I read at the beginning of this year. And he, he describes the outbreak of this, what he calls the Nika insurrection, because as you will see, it ends up becoming a, a rival government almost. The year 532 opened with the Nika insurrection. It appears to have been an altercation in the Hippodrome between Justinian and the Greens. So it starts with the rivalry I was talking about, right? But Justinian's on the blue side. The Greens complained they were being oppressed and even killed by a court eunuch, Calipodius. And so here we have this clash between the authorities and the Greens, right? The exchange became acrimonious. Justinian, who supported the Blues, replied through a herald, Silence, you Jews, Manichaeans, Samaritans. The Greens replied, Would that Sabates, who was Justinian's father, had not been born, so that he would not have had a murderer for a son. Farewell, justice, you exist no more. I shall turn and become a Jew. Better to be a pagan than a blue. And this really, this mounting kind of escalation, where Justinian himself takes sides, and where the both sides are saying, basically, you're worse than a foreigner, which might ring true if you've heard people fighting over sports rivalries, that they're traitors, they're betrayers, they're outsiders. If you've ever ridden back from London after a major football game, or if you lived in Detroit or Chicago in the 1990s when major serious riots broke out over the Bulls, and I think it was the Pistons, right? You know this kind of spirit, and it's starting to get really ugly and really out of hand. And that's when the Blues and the Greens get into such a big fight that some of their leaders on both sides are arrested and sentenced to death. This is where the whole thing just starts to become... I mean, it, the benefit of historical hindsight is that we don't have to live through it, so we don't have to suffer the, the pain and the fear of it. And at that point, it just becomes impossible to look away because this stuff goes so wild, so out of hand... The Green and the Blues join forces to demand the return of two of their leaders whose execution was botched. So they've gotten away out of this mass execution of seven leaders. Two of them, from, one from each team, survives. And so the crowd demands the return of these people. The authorities refuse. They start to, the crowd of Blues and Greens together starts to march through the city chanting Nika, which is where we get our name for the riot. It's a Greek word meaning win, win, win. So probably this was a chant that they could have used in the Hippodrome. Now they're using it for themselves. We are going to win this dispute between the authorities and us. Nika, Nika, they set fire to the Praetorion, which is where these two guys are being held. They set fire to the Hippodrome. The whole thing really just goes 
deeply, deeply south. Street fighting, more fires, the Hagia Sophia, which is still one of the glories of Christendom, but had to be rebuilt after this. The Hagia Sophia is burned. And then they proclaim their own emperor. <laughs> so they, they basically just decided, we're, look at us, we're the captains now. They take charge. They elevate this guy, Hypatius, as a rival emperor to Justinian. And it's only after Justinian, who gets kind of a pep talk, it seems, from Theodora, sends out Belisarius and the troops to lay down the law once you get the like real shock troops, the real riot police. Then the whole thing ends with the slaughter of the crowd in the Hippodrome en masse. And so this was a dark, dark day for Justinian's regime. It, of course, is made much of in the sources, especially Procopius, because it really looks bad for him. It was a huge embarrassment. But for us, I think, it reveals a few things about the nature of Thumos, which is that it works great as a servant of reason and terribly, hellishly, when it becomes its own god. And that leads me into this listener question, which was, can sports teams become allegregors? And I think this was inspired by the fact that in our modern sports teams, which do sometimes get out of hand in the same way, although never to this sheer extent of the Nika riots in, in American history that I can think of. You know, the, the 1990s riots come closest, but even that is, is nothing like the death toll here. Still, we know this spirit and we associate it in our experience with mascots, right? With these team animals or ideas or embodiments of the, of the team spirit, which actually is associated with a kind of sorcery. The word mascotto is a word for like witchery and enchantment. And this seems to be where the word mascot comes from. But it is a modern idea to have these particular mascots or emblems or heroes. Still, they start to take on a kind of life of their own in this egregoric way. That is, the collective action begins as something that's just the sum of its parts. It's just a bunch of people getting together to watch a game. But gradually, as that spirit starts to move people, if you submit to it, if you allow yourself to be swept away by that spirit, it's almost as if it has a power of its own. Now, you're always free to act as you choose. No egregore, no allegregore can take away your free will. But much like demons and spirits and angels, they have this extreme power of influence over people so that they can enter into a kind of frenzy. And examples of this abound in the literature of Bacchic frenzy, of course, because wine, the god of wine is sort of one famous pagan god who whips people up into these kinds of frenzies. But the major Christian critique, especially at this period in history of the pagan gods, was that they could all, if left unchecked, whip people up into these murderous frenzies. And so if I had to pick a pagan god that is kind of at work in sports and who rampages when sports gets out of hand, it would be Mars. It would be the god of war. And Crucially, in the Greek pantheon, there are actually two gods who preside over war, one of whom is Athena, and she's also the goddess of wisdom. So she perhaps represents Thumos when it is marshaled in the service of Logos, in, in the service of the good and the true and the ideal. Mars, on the other hand, represents raw, unfettered will to power, domination, violence. He represents the way in which war, whether good or bad, and the spirit of war, whether well or badly directed, once it gets going, it takes on, like a flame, its own logic that just wants to kill for the sake of killing. And I think this is why Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general, had this great line where he said, it is well that war is so horrible, otherwise we would grow too fond of it. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's basically what he said. He said, it's a good thing that this war business is so ugly and painful and violent because in itself it has its own kind of satisfaction. And if that satisfaction is let loose, it can burn the whole city down, including the church, right? And I, I think there is something to this if we consider that this is what the Christian influence did to all of these pagan gods. It said, it's not that these aren't forces in the world. It's not that they don't have a certain degree of sway over us. It's that each one of them is insufficient to rule the world. And if allowed to rule the world, if you let it take over the world, it will destroy the world and turn it into hell. And that is how the pagan gods come to be associated with demons, because demons are 
the entities, however you want to understand them ontologically, they are the forces that take naturally good things and twist and distort them and blow them out of proportion until they destroy, until they tear us apart, which is basically what you see here in these allegregors, that if they are domesticated and given remit and shape and form under a larger logic, a higher power, such as a god who is outside of nature and above any of the natural forces like wine and war and the weather and all that, if that happens, then they can be part of a beautiful creation and made even to serve God. That's what the baptism of the pagan gods sort of looks like. But when they are unleashed and when they are worshipped and when they are made into the sole power in the world, then these allegregors turn into demons. And that, too, was the critique of the pagan gods. So what I'm trying to get at here is that the world has not fundamentally changed since the era of the pagan gods. Human nature is the same. The forces acting on human nature are the same. We now have material explanations that describe what goes on physically in some cases when these things happen. But those material explanations don't give us a full account of what goes on when these spirits take on a power that is greater than any individual mind within them. When these things have a spirit all their own, there's no neurological explanation for what goes on. There's no way that you can describe what's happening in pure brain scan terms. You need reference to these larger terms. And I submit that an allegregor is basically just a modern way of describing a pagan god run amok, run loose, which is kind of what I'm driving at here because I really think we need language to describe the world in a way that is recognizable to us both in our scientific mindset, that is in our natural rationalist kind of idea that the world is just made of cause and effect and interactions, and in the spiritual truth that we all sense and know is also part of things. And this really is palimpsestic. These two worlds are layered on top of each other. And when you start to see the head of Mars kind of rearing over the landscape, then you realize that those forces never went away and are in fact still at work and still need a higher power, higher than science, higher than law and order, higher than any of these things that transcends nature altogether in order to keep them from destroying us, in order to domesticate, to baptize, whatever you want to call it. That's my answer to the question whether sports is an allegregor. I think it can be because I think it is effectively a clearinghouse for thumos, for passion, for spirit, for the power that, that drives us also to war. And that passion, like every other component part of creation, requires some kind of higher power to direct it. And if that higher power is, is good, then Thumas will become good. And if that higher power is evil, or if there is no such higher power, you're going to end up with what it began as a fight over politics and over religion and over all these smaller allegiances turning into a carnage for carnage's sake, which is ostensibly what we saw in 2020 when what began as a history of racial grievance turned into a kind of orgy of violence and looting and, and arson. That's what happens when these things get out of hand. That's why we should reflect, I think, seriously on what is great enough to bring these forces to heal because they're not going away. They're part of us and they need some higher logic, some higher order to serve. Which brings me now to my mailbag question. I got a great mailbag question. I always get great mailbag questions, and they always come to me through Substack. I'm on Substack at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. And you can DM me there if you're a subscriber. You can also write to me when I send out my Friday newsletter. You can write back with your questions. Either way, always great to hear from you. And today I have a question from a fellow named Grant, who says some very lovely things about he's been listening to the show for the whole time, I've been listening from the very first episode. The podcast has played a major role in my coming to Christianity as well, as well as my journey into reading the great works of the West. This is so great to hear, man. Thank you for telling me. I'm incredibly honored by that. Whenever I can play some part in uh, kind of helping you along a good path, I'm just it, it makes it makes me joyful. Um, here's here's his mailbag question. When I was listening to your episode on Euhemerus, which is kind of what got us on this whole Allegregor kick, when I was listening to your episode on Euhemerus. You mentioned that in order to convert the pagans of the ancient world to Christianity, evangelists had to use logic that would make sense to a people with no exposure to the Old Testament. This is true. I was saying that 
when you are preaching to an ancient city, if you're St. Paul, for example, you have to use different tactics with different people because when you're speaking to Jews who are steeped in the Hebrew Bible, you can refer to their shared knowledge of that Bible to mention that there is a Messiah who is to come, that he's going to have these different attributes that are described in the prophecies. Now look at the life of Jesus and let me tell you how that life matches this template. He fits into the outline, the silhouette that is drawn by the Hebrew Bible. So that's an effective route into evangelism for Jewish listeners. But then when you go out to the pagan tribes, to people who have never read perhaps the Old Testament and who worship these allegoric gods like Mars and Venus and Athena and whatever, then you have to take a totally different route in and it's going to be much more about reason and the Greek tradition of philosophy, but also about acknowledging how these forces in nature that the Greeks worship are part of a creation with an order and an intention, but not the, the, the forces themselves are not the highest thing that they can't be. And this was an argument that was readily available in Greek philosophy, and Paul makes use of it. They can't, these, these warring competing forces will destroy us unless they are under some higher power. And that's a completely different argument for a people that is coming at the gospel from a completely different place. And this is why Grant's question is so insightful. He says, this got me thinking about how when I have discussions with my atheist and agnostic friends, one of the most compelling arguments that I've found is the immutable mathematical laws that govern the universe and our ability to perceive and interpret them. My question is, do you think this is an apt analogy? And what are your thoughts on meeting modern pagans where they are today in order to evangelize? Yes. And so this is the thing, right? If the gospel really is, the incarnation of Christ really is, the core truth at the heart of reality. It's there's no one in the world for whom this isn't true. And this is not a con culturally contingent thing. This is something that everyone is supposed to be able to access, people from all tribes, all nations, everywhere. Then everyone is going to have a different angle on it. Everyone's going to be coming to it from somewhere on the periphery because we humans do have reason. We are able to know truth partially. But we are limited. We are always restricted and bound by our upbringing, the accidents or apparent accidents of our birth, the contingencies about where we happen to come from, what our local traditions teach us, and what we have had to do to live in whatever society we live in. And it's from that starting point that we have to approach God and approach the gospel. And even though the God we approach is the same God, the route that we take is going to be from a different starting point. And this is a key feature to understand if you're trying to talk, how to talk to your friends about God, right? If you're trying to talk to people about God, you have to understand that they're going to be coming to it from a different place than you came to it. I, from Santa Barbara, California, came to it from a different place than Paul came to it from the Jewish tradition than like the Japanese Christians in the story of Shogun come to it from their tradition. I mean, that's the whole point of these stories is that how do you approach this one core truth from these very, very different angles? In the modern day, I think one mistake we make is we talk as if we're still talking to the people Paul was talking to, to ancient pagans or ancient Jews even, in that we tell the good news as if nobody's ever heard it before. And the problem is that the people we're talking to, in, in very few cases are we talking to people who've never heard the gospel in its material particulars. No, nobody is sitting around thinking, I don't believe in God because I've just never heard about Jesus. I mean, there are people who have never internalized the truth of what Jesus means, but nobody needs to be told, like, there was this guy called Jesus who lived and died and was resurrected. Or like, if there are those people, they're not the people that we're most sort of struggling with when we think about modern paganism. We're talking about people who know the basic idea of the story, but have a distorted view of it that dismisses it out of hand as superstition. And so what you need is a route from their self-imposed kind of hyper-rationalism, their idea that the only truths are the truths described by mathematics, into the idea that that's an incomplete worldview and that actually how can they see that the prophecies of their mathematics are fulfilled by Jesus in just the same way that the prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled by Jesus. And one route into that is simply to say mathematics, like any natural reality, like any pagan god, is incomplete without something higher than itself because the very fact that our minds are shaped to know the mathematical reality 
truths and postulates, and that those postulates themselves are not time-bound, but actually in some sense eternal, that they are true everywhere and always and throughout time. And the fact that our brains can even intuit some of these concepts and recognize them as true requires you to believe, if you want to say that everything I just said is valid, then you also have to believe that there is some higher order that is joining our minds with the mathematical world, that that isomorphism, that kind of match in the shape of our brains with the shape of the logical structure of the world, if two things match like that, it's either the kind of accident that like would never happen in a billion billion rolls of the dice, or it's the consequence of some third power that is above either our mind or the postulates of mathematics that have that's placed both of them there in order to understand each other so that we would have a language for knowing him through his creation. And this is, in some sense, the argument that I make in my new book. And it's why I wrote this book the way that I wrote it. It's called Light of the Mind, Light of the World. And the two parts of the title are about the idea that the world meets our mind and our mind meets the world. And that's how reality comes into being. We have this idea that everything is just these objects out in the world. But in fact, even science sort of suggests that the picture is more complicated than that. And by looking at the history of science and kind of the trajectory it's taken and the development it's taken, I think we can get a route into the truths of God and of scripture that begins from a wholly scientific worldview and then moves beyond that and, and, and through it. So that's what the book is about, and I do really hope that you will pre-order it. The link is also in the show notes. Light of the Mind, Light of the World, coming out in August. Would really, really love for you to read it because I think it's got a lot of stuff in it that you will like, that will delight and entertain you, but also hopefully make you think more about how to move through this world of science and scientific wonders and good stuff and true knowledge into a world of absolute truth and, and spiritual knowledge, which we have yet, I think, really to do. And it is the great challenge of our age. So thank you for that excellent, two excellent questions. Thank you as always for listening and for your support. It means the world to me. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, give the show five stars, help people to find it, share it wherever you are. Would really appreciate all of that. And I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.